So in this lecture, we're going to introduce the SN1 reaction. So what exactly is an SN1 reaction? Well, let's suppose we go back to the SN2 reaction. And let's suppose we have the following nucleophile and our substrate. Recall that we said whenever we have a tertiary substrate, in other words, when this carbon is attached to three methyl groups, our nucleophile will not be able to get to this carbon because this carbon is too sterically hindered and that means no SN2 reaction will take place. Once again, the third butyl chloride as shown above is too sterically hindered at the carbon atom and the nucleophile cannot find a pathway in which the SN2 reaction can take place. On the other hand, an SN2 reaction will take place. And let's quickly overview what the SN1 reaction is. So in the first step, our leaving group detaches from our carbon. So we simply get the following first step. We have our substrate, our third butyl chloride, and this bond breaks off by itself and we form the following two products. Why is it that this uh, bond breaks off? Well, because our solvent stabilizes these products. So even though this reaction is endothermic, as we'll, as we'll see in a second, the products are still stabilized by our solvent. Uh, usually the solvent is water. So let's examine the second step. What happens once our carbocation, this is known as our carbocation, is formed? So this carbocation can either do two things. A water molecule or some nucleophile if it's present. So this nucleophile, a water molecule, our solvent, or another nucleophile if it's present, can attack this carbon, can capture this carbon. So a lone pair of electrons on our water molecule will attack this carbon, for, forming the following intermediate. So notice that this intermediate will have the following positive charge on our oxygen. And the final step, which is really part of the second step, is known as deprotonation. In this step, one of the H atoms is taken away by either a water molecule or our chloride that we produced uh, in the first step. So let's say the chloride, lone pair of electrons, takes the H atom away from our uh, intermediate and we form the following final products. So we form our HCl as well as our alcohol. So this is known as the SN1 reaction and it stands for Substitution Nucleophilic Unimolecular Reaction. So let's break down all these steps into their individual steps and let's discuss them and their relevance. So let's take step one for instance. Once again, in step one, we have the following third butyl chloride molecule. And we said that in the first step, this bond simply dissociates, this lone pair of electron goes onto this chloride atom. And we form the following two products or the following two intermediates. Now, this is known as the ionization step. Why? Well, because we have an ionization of this chloride. The leaving group, in this case our chloride, simply dissociates from the substrate, forming what we know as a carbocation intermediate. Now, this carbocation intermediate has a positive charge and a negative charge. And this is stabilized by our solvent, which is usually a water molecule. Water is a protic uh, polar molecule, and that means it will donate an H to this chloride, and it will uh, associate the oxygen, which has a partially negative charge, with this carbocation positive charge. Now, notice this is a slow step, and because it's a, so, it's a slow step, it's a rate-determining step. So it determines the rate of our reaction. And this reaction, because we go from a neutral molecule to two positive molecules, this will be an endothermic step. So our reaction, the equilibrium, will lie towards the left, towards our reactant side. So because this is the rate determining step, we use this step and not any other step to write our rate law for our reaction. So the rate law states the following. 
the rate of the full reaction is given by the substrate, the concentration of the substrate, our reactant, multiplied by the rate constant, which depends on our particular reaction. So this K is different for different reactions. Now notice that our rate is independent of the nucleophile or the solvent used. So if we have some nucleophile present in our reaction, the nucleophile will not determine the rate of our reaction. Alright, so let's go to step two. Let's look at the following step as well as the deprotonation step. So in step two, we have the carbocation intermediate and we have either a nucleophile present in our solution or simply our solvent molecule, in this case water. So either of these guys are nucleophiles because they have lone pair of electrons and these lone pair of electrons can capture or can bond to this carbon which has a positive charge. So we go from the following molecule to this molecule. In this molecule we have our water or the nucleophile attached to our carbon. In the case of the nucleophile our reaction is done but in this case we have a positive charge on the oxygen and this is not a good thing. So deprotonation or the removal of an H ion take uh, takes place. By what molecule? Well we either have the solvent molecule that has a lone pair of electrons or our chloride molecule that left when it dissociated in the first step. So either this chloride or a water molecule can use its lone pair of electrons to take this H ion away from this positively charged species and we produce our final product. So here we have our uh, alcohol and here we have our HCl molecule because the Cl took away the H. So if this is A, let's say this is product A or reactant A, let's say this carbocation is product B and this uh, product, final product is product C. If we draw the energy versus reaction progress diagram, we see the following result. Here we have A, the energy level of A is here. Next we have B. Notice that when we go from A to B, we increase the energy and that's because this reaction is endothermic because we go from neutral molecule to a um, carbocation which has a positive charge. So we're going to increase in energy in the first slow rate determining step. Now, in the second step, we go from a carbocation intermediate to our final product. So we go from a positive to a neutral. So that means we're going to drop, and so this reaction is exothermic. Our equilibrium lies towards the product side. And in fact, C is lower in energy than either B or A. Now these humps are the transition states. They're the energy maxima and they will not be isolated. We can't isolate these molecules because they're too unstable. They're either going to go back to A or to B. In this case from, uh, from B to C. So once again, the second step is the structure determining step. Why? Well because this is a very quick step and it determines the structure of the final product. So the second step is the structure determining step and it occurs very quickly. Either the nucleophile, so the nucleophile, or our solvent molecule, the water molecule in this case, attacks the carbon atom, attacks this carbocation intermediate. This step is exothermic, it releases energy, and it produces the product that is more stable than the intermediate or our beginning uh, reactant, given here by A. So, what can we conclude about the SN1 reaction? This is supposed to be SN1. Okay. So, SN1 reaction occurs in two steps. The first is the slow rate determining ionization step. In this step, our leaving group simply dissociates all by itself because we have a solvent present. That solvent will stabilize our products to a certain extent or our intermediates to a certain extent. The second step 
is the capture of the carbocation by either the nucleophile or our nucleophilic water molecule. Now, usually, tertiary and secondary structures undergo SN1 reactions. So, as we'll see in a later lecture, SN1 reaction competes with SN2 reactions. In the SN1 reaction, we have a tertiary substrate or a secondary substrate. Sometimes primary substrates also undergo SN1, but usually not. Now for the SN2 reactions, usually we have the primary and second, uh, the primary and methyl structures undergo SN2 reactions and sometimes secondary.